では、えー、時間になりましたので、えー、ガルドシーネスさんによる、えー、パール・ボーデニーに何言うです。Good morning. Okay,、uh, that's not me. That's me. <clears throat> I'm RJBS. You can call me Rick. I work at Pobox. We do a lot of email things. And I'm the current Perl 5 pumpkin,、uh, which means I run the project and make sure that we keep putting out releases. Today I'm going to talk to you about Perl 5.22. Perl 5.22 is our newest release. Our releases work like this. Every year, We put out a new stable Perl 5, and the idea is that every new version has to be better than the last one. And better means I like it more. And the first thing I like to do to get a better release of Perl every year is to eject code, to get rid of stuff that I don't like. We delete all the old crazy code to make room for new crazy code. So let's talk about the stuff we deleted, because even if we don't need to know it anymore, It's pretty funny. Everybody knows this. Here we have、uh, an array, and we push some values onto the array. Totally normal. Or we have a hash, and we iterate over the keys of the hash. Everyone who writes Perl has seen Perl like this. What you may not know is that you could also write this. You can push onto an array with no sigil, and you can iterate over a hash. You can call keys on a hash with no sigil. Why can you do that? I don't know. But we fixed it, and the way we fixed it is to forbid it. If you try doing that, the compiler will hit you with a stick and you will fix it.、Uh, hash references. Everyone who writes Perl knows hashes. At one point, they were what made Perl so amazing. And the hash works like this you have a hash and you pull a key out of it with a subscript, or you put a value into it with a subscript. But did you know you could also write this? You can pretend that your hash is a hash reference, but instead of a dollar sign sigil, you stick to your percent sigil. Why can you do that? I don't know. I think it comes from when they introduced references and they just thought they wanted to put arrows everywhere.、Uh, well, we fixed that too, it's gone. Okay, regex. This should be unsurprising to everyone. If you iterate over 10 numbers, And you print them if they match dot, you will print one, two, three, four, and so on. But if you do this, this is not seen very often. What will happen here is it will print one. That special kind of regular expression only matches the first time until you run reset.、Oh, but no one ever runs reset. So it only matches once. That's gone. We didn't get rid of the feature. The feature is useful. I've used it. I've probably used it.、Um, and you still can. You just need to put the M there. Okay? Definedness. People write this a lot. And I like to ask whether anyone knows what this means. And if you think you know what it means, you are probably wrong. Because no one, we don't know what it means.、It's, it tells you whether a cosmic ray has hit your computer.、Uh, so this is gone. You can still use defined on scalars, of course. You can use defined on subroutines, but on these, it's gone. Okay, how about this? The C escape is to let us make control characters. Can anyone shout out what is control X? It's cancel. I've never used it, but it's one of the, one of the easier to know ones.、Uh, control at sign is even easier to know. That's null. But then we start wondering what is control space? I, I didn't know. I had to ask Perl, and Perl told me it was the Grav accent, okay? How about control cancel? That's our little symbol for cancel there. What is control cancel? Well, it just flips all the same bits, and you get back the capital letter X. It goes both ways. Great. But what if we ask control inverted question mark? Well, that one really got me interested, and I, I just had no idea, so I fired up the debugger. And I said, hey, debugger, what's control inverted question mark? And the debugger said, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I didn't know what to do, so I said, I bet, it's, I bet my terminal 
is not working. It, my input didn't work. It's, it's, it's doing something else. So I, I said, I'll do this. I'll build a string that starts with control C, then has an inverted question mark that I don't have to type, and end quote, and I'll eval that. Skip the whole terminal problem. Now I'll get the real answer. What is in there? <laughs> so uh, I didn't like this answer. It turns out that it's because what I've gotten is uh, a very big character. It's, it's not really sure what it is or how to print it. And I knew there was only a, one good answer for what this should be, and that's the answer you get now, which is an exception. Your program will die. It'll say, don't, don't. You're being a jerk. Okay. Uh, more things jerks do is write programs like this. Uh, you might print dollar hat h. That is the compile time hints. What you don't know is that you could also write that code like this. Why does that work? Well, whenever you have a variable that starts with circumflex and a letter, you could instead use the control form of that letter. Remember how control x was cancel? Well, control h is something. It's a backspace. So dollar backspace dollar hat h. This became an issue uh, because some people could use this, dollar hat k. Well, control k is vertical tab. And we had to fix a bug where Perl didn't think that vertical tabs were space characters. And now all of your source code turned from thinking that was a variable into thinking it was a space. So the fix is you can't do this anymore. You can't put literal control characters in your source. And if you ever did it before, you were just doing it so that when we fixed it, you could complain. That's the only reason. Okay. Uh, universal. Uh, did you know not only do all of your objects have the methods from universal, also you can import them. Or you could until earlier this year, at which point we took that out. Uh, other things we've taken out include old modules that used to ship with Perl and no longer do. One of those is module build. Module build is no longer part of the core distribution. It was a really good idea, but it didn't really work. Also CGIPM. CGIPM, once a cornerstone of Perl, is gone, and CGIPM will be, well, uh, yeah. Well, uh, Better. Okay. Uh, another change we we're trying to make is to improve the character of our mailing list. I think the Perl development mailing list is actually pretty good, but it's not perfect. We have added a standards of conduct to our list that you are expected to abide by, and they say this. Be kind. Be kind to one another. If you can't manage that, be civil. And if you can't manage to be civil, we will escort you out of the building and you can go act that way somewhere else. There are many other programming languages that have their own mailing lists. The Linux kernel mailing list, for example, is available. Okay, uh, enough about things we're getting rid of. Let's talk about what we've added. What's the new crazy? File handles, so the diamond operator, we all know the diamond operator lets you write a program that could take standard input or it could take file names, and it will iterate all over all of the input line by line. And it does that by using open. And it's using two arg open. And everybody knows we're not supposed to like two arg open, and sometimes we forget why, but I will remind you. If you write your program like that second version with some file names, it opens each one using two arg open. Well, what if someone gives you that file name? That pipe at the end means run the program named in the file name, and in trying to open it, it will delete all your stuff. So we have added a new operator, the double diamond. It is twice as valuable. And when you give it the, uh, the program form, it will try to open a file name called that. You probably don't have a file called that, but it would work if you did. Okay, this, another form of open, this is opening a pipe from a program where we're giving arguments to the program. And you're maybe thinking, this works. This is not a new feature. This feature has been there since Perl 5.6, 5.8. Yes, but now it works on Windows. So, 
People like to use this version of open, uh, not just three arguments, but with a lexical variable. And the reason is, if your lexical variable is in a scope and you leave scope, your file handle is closed. You can't leak file handles. But if your disk was full and you couldn't close and the close failed, nothing tells you and you just lost your file. In the newest pearls, 522, you will get a warning. It will say, you had me closing this file handle and it didn't work, that's bad. And if you want, you can make that warning fatal at runtime so your program will get an exception when it tries to close something and fails. Ah, we have restored support for ZOS. Yay! Uh, anyone here using Z Perl on ZOS? Yeah, that's about the size of it. Um, but it means we have working EBCDIC and UTF EBCDIC support, which we have had for a long time if you stayed on Perl 5.8. Uh, it's not exciting for us, but if you have been stuck writing Perl 5.8 on a mainframe, now your life can be a little better. Uh, regular expression changes. So, word boundaries. Uh, this finds boundaries between words, and it looks for a word character followed by not a word character, or the reverse. So if we take uh, these lyrics and we split that string based on backslash b, we get this. It's not bad, but it's not perfect. We see don't has split around the apostrophes. It's not quite right. Unicode has suggestions for how to do this, and now you get a new break, word boundary b, and it will split based on Unicode suggestions, which are much better. There's one little artifact right about there, uh, which shows you some extra space gets broken. I was curious to see how this does on Japanese. Uh, I asked Google Translate to translate this for me. It told me this. I assume that's an amusing mistranslation, but I don't know. <clears throat> if you split that on backslash B, you get this. Probably not right. If you split it with backslash BW, you do get that, but you get a little more uh, like that. <laughs> it, it turns out that is because we've used hiragana. If I had used katakana, there would be no breaks between any two katakana. Probably also not very good. Uh, but this is probably the only time that computer programming languages have not gotten Japanese or Asian languages right. Right? So one time's okay. Uh, <clears throat> we can also break on sentences. Uh, we can break on grapheme cluster boundaries, which means basically every character. But the reason that's useful is that we're not breaking on grapheme clusters like we break on words. We're doing it when we split a string into pieces. It's like split on nothing. But if we split this on nothing, sometimes it would be right if that character is one Y with diaresis. But if it's a Y and then a diaresis, we'd have split it into that. Grapheme clusters will always get it right. I wanted to make a Japanese example of this too. I don't actually know <laughs> any Japanese at all, so next, next year. Okay, uh, so we've got a regular expression. And it's very clear, everyone can read this, it's obvious what we're doing, right? Uh, we're parsing versions. This is a mess, so how can we fix it? We'll put in more white space, like this. We want V and some numbers, and then some dots and numbers, then maybe an underscore and some numbers. And we can do that because we use X. We'll just put in white space. But the other thing that's annoying is turning off capturing over and over. Question mark colon, question mark colon, question mark colon. Well, what if we could turn off all the capturing at once? Now you can do that with the N modifier. It says nothing captures. But it turns out, having done this, we realize we didn't even need that first group. We can get rid of even more noise, make it even clearer. The problem is, what if it turned out that we did need some capturing. If we wanted to capture one or two things, well, there's a very clear way to do it. We just turn off that flag, which is great. Looks good, no, not confusing at all. Well, no, it's actually terrible. Uh, but there is a better way to do it. And instead of turning off non-capturing, we use named captures. Named captures always capture. There's no question, should these parentheses capture? If there's a named capture, yes. And then we can pull it out from uh, percent plus down at the bottom. Now, I would never write this bottom line. What I would write is this. Uh, get a pair of keys and values. 
If you don't understand what's going on there, that's because it's also pretty new, and it's like this. You probably know you can get a slice of values out of an array. So you use an at sign instead of a dollar sign with your brackets, and it gives you a list of the values at positions one and three. You can also do that with a hash. You can pull out uh, the values from multiple keys at once. What do you get out? You get one and three, because those are the values for A and C. What we've introduced is the ability to get a slice of pairs like this. We use a percent sigil for our hash instead of an at symbol, and you get both the key and the value. Now, here we've assigned it into a hash because it's a sub hash, but you don't have to. You could get out, put it out into an array, and here we've asked for A, D, and A. So we've gotten one pair twice. D didn't exist originally, so we get undef for its value. You can also use pair slicing on arrays, and you get the keys and values. At first, this might not seem useful, but if we go back to my earlier problem of repeating things, I'll think of this example, the example you see all the time of someone's music collection. This is the canonical example for database software. You're storing your CDs. And here there's a bug. And you may have seen it, and if you didn't, the bug is, is this. I've misspelled label. You notice it's only a bug because I had to type it twice. I had to type many things twice. Artist, artist, title, title, tracks, tracks, year, year. When I had to type something twice, it's twice as likely that I'm going to spell it wrong. And I was already pretty likely to spell it wrong the first time. So we can eliminate this duplication. We take these pairs and we turn them into slices. After all, they're all coming from the hash album. So we do this. I want the key value pairs, artist, title, and tracks. And we get artist, artist, title, title, tracks, tracks. But we didn't do it. Now, the, why did I leave those other ones undone? Well, you may already know, but if you don't, it's because let's imagine we have a hash ref with a hash ref. And from inside of it, we want to pull out a slice of the value for x. What's the syntax for that? I, I kind of write a lot of Perl and I never remember. I, I'll write maybe this, I try that, and that, that evaluates to undef. Okay. Uh, how about this? Now that throws, that throws an exception, it's not an array reference. This one just returns an empty list, and this one works. Every time, I have to do it four times, every time. Well, so here, maybe I'd rather just leave it than figure out how to do the slice. But what if I could write this? So instead of having to do a postfix dereference with a suffixed subscript, blah, 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 I can just say this. Uh, I want to put my slice at the end. We can do this now. We can put any kind of postfix, any kind of dereferencing at the end. It looks like this. Here's some code that I don't like. We're going to call a method on something in a hash entry on an object and then dereference it. The problem here, right, we start writing our code at the left and then we go right and then we go back and we put this little at sign in and then we go back over here and then down here, the same thing. We start at the left, we go to the right, we go to the right, then we go back and then back over here. Now, perhaps some people can know before they start writing the code that they will need to do a dereference. I am not that person. I never realize that I need that dereference until I've written my long line and then I go back to normal mode and go all the way back to the beginning of the line, enter insert mode and it's the worst. Well now you can write this, left to right. Session, user, logins, dereference array. Q, unflushed, logins, dereference array. You can use this anywhere, right? We can use it here. It's not just because it's push. We can use it as a subroutine argument. We can put it here on the map. And how about this? This guy, what are we doing here? We're getting the maximum index number of an array reference. Do that. You can do this for any kind of reference. Array reference, hash reference, scalar reference, subroutine reference. Even works on glob references. I don't know why you would ever do this. Uh, Index, you can do slices. Any kind of slice that you want to pull out of a reference, you can do postfix now. There is almost no reason to ever use circumfix. It also works inside of strings. 
you can put these inside of your strings to interpolate. Anywhere that you could use circumfix, you can now use postfix. That's postfix dereferencing. It's a new experimental feature from last year. New experimental feature from this year is reference aliasing. So <clears throat> we've got a variable and we take a reference to it. And if we act on the reference, now look, we had to dereference this with that at sign. We act on the reference and look at the original, the array, we've affected the array. That's how references work. But I really don't like double sigils. It makes me feel too much like I'm writing Perl 6. So we just made a copy, right? What if we just, we're just gonna say we put it in there? But of course the problem there is it doesn't work. It doesn't do what you want. We wanted something that would affect the original. But we don't want double sigils or any kind of dereferencing because it, it becomes noise. It becomes the reason people don't like Perl because of all the funny characters. So here what we've done is we put a backslash on both sides. We're saying the reference to this is now, this is a reference to the same thing as this is a reference to. And then when we act on the alias, it has the same effect on the array. They are in effect the same variable. We can use this in lots of places. So for example here, we're gonna iterate over a list of hash references and on each one, we have to use a dereference. We've got all these arrows in our string. Instead, we can get rid of those arrows by saying each hash reference from the list, this becomes an alias to it. And now these act just like on normal hashes. They're not copies, they're aliases. If we made changes to the to do, now there's a typo, this should also say to do. If we made a, uh, a change to these, it would change the original because they are aliases to the same thing. We can do, use this for this. We can uh, topicalize over the same deep reference, just like that, by putting the backslash here and making it an alias, so something deep, deep in there and eliminating the need to always do the same series of arrows. And we might put that into a, uh, into a scope so that we're not leaking this alias all over the place. But once you do that, why not use a proper topicalizer, use four, and, uh, and now we have a way to sort of write a with block or a, to say I want a new variable that is an alias to some deep part of the structure and eliminate all the noise you're used to seeing in your Perl code. So that's new this year. Uh, that is I think the list of all the new features and now we can talk about the thing everybody likes to hear about which is making Perl faster. The problem with talking about how we make Perl faster is that it's not usually very interesting how we made it faster. Uh, so I'll tell you the interesting thing up front. Perl's a lot faster now. Uh, Great, so I'll, I'll tell you a few things that were interesting. Um, this is a little bit interesting. If you have a string and you split it into an array, it used to have to take the string in memory, make a list in memory, and then assign it to the array. So there's this, this intermediate copy that's gone. Uh, so there's no more double copying of anything that you split. When you call a method, there's a lookup to figure out where that method lives, what package in your inheritance chain. And there's a cache after the first time. Now, while we compile, we build the cache. So here, seeing that there's a new method inside of my class, it'll add that to the method resolution cache as it compiles, which means your code has a femtosecond, a tiny, tiny bit longer compile time for a significantly faster run, or noticeably faster run times. That's all part of the method operator, method call operator. We added one more new operator, which is the multi-deref operator to explain. We have another, another one of these long, terrible, uh, deep structures that we need to look into. The zeroth element, and then its key, and then another array reference, and so on. When Perl runs this, it has to constantly say, okay, I have a variable, then an item in it, and then it gets that. And then the item in that, now it has that. And it goes through these, one by one. It's very, very slow. It actually turns out to be much slower than you'd expect, because it has to do a lot of sanity checking each time it gets a result and wants to apply the next dereference. In the new code, Perl will see this and then say, I have to do a big dereference and it does it all in one operation in C and it's really fast. But that's enough about optimization. Let's talk about something cool. NANDs. Those are cool, right? Um, so programs have infinity, 
You can do stuff with infinities. Sometimes infinities give you not numbers. That's great. Um, and this all seems to make sense if you know what inf and nan are. Now this is what you get uh, on an old Perl on my computer. If you were using someone else's computer, you might get this. That's a little more confusing, but the question is why are they different at all? It used to be we would fall back to the operating system's representation of all these weird values. Now we have a standard form. Everything will always do this. If you've written code that deals with inf and nan on the CPAN and you had to think about every platform's version, you don't anymore as long as you require Perl 522. Uh, another weird problem. So when you add zero to nan, you get nan. That makes sense. But if you add zero to nancy, you get nan. Why is that? Well, it's because if you add zero to one, two, three, abc, you get one, two, three. Perl will take as much of the beginning that looks like a number and treat that as the number. But you get something else, too. You get a warning. You don't get that warning with zero plus nancy. You don't even get it with something a little longer. It's just like, oh, yeah, 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 you meant nan. Great, no problem. Uh, we fixed this. Now, admittedly, we fixed it by just adding the warning, so it's still really strange. Uh, but hey, consistency is not a bad thing. So that's not a number. Let's talk about not not numbers. Some people call these numbers. And the numbers I want to talk about are floats. Not these kind of floats. Uh, this number is pretty clear. It's 1.23 times 10 to the fourth. I want to talk about these floats. That's a hex float. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's say we had that old one. What does this mean? It's 1 plus 23 over 100 times 10 to the fourth. Probably we've all seen this before. Hex float is exactly the same thing. It's E plus A3 over OX100 times 2 to the fourth. Why would you use this? Well, one answer is the reason you use this is that you are guaranteed that a hex float can be represented as a binary floating point number. You will never have a rounding error. Probably the more correct answer is you won't use this. But now you can. Uh, if you've got that number, which by the way is about 234, and you want to turn it back into a string, you might want to start using percent %x. Percent %x will not do what you want because percent %x is for integers. You need to use percent %a. So you put in e.a3p4 and you pass it to percent %a and you get back what? One point, well it turns out they're exactly the same. Now when you have the exponent change in a, uh, a decimal number, it's very clear because just the point moves around. When that exponent change in a hexadecimal number, you're never ever going to recognize it. So enjoy. All right. So speaking of things that are numbers or not numbers, uh, we're, getting, we're getting on. I think we're going to liven things up and play a game. We're going to play name that operator. This operator, what context are those variables used in? How are they used? What's their type? Somebody shout it out. Numbers. numbers. These are numbers. How about these? What context? How are these used? Strings. How about this? Oh, no, wait, stop. Sorry. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why that slide is there. Uh, this. Boolean. How about these? <laughs> Someone says bitwise. Right, but what is, what is x as a bitwise? I don't know. This is a problem. If you have two numbers, numbers. You already should know this is a problem. You never have a number in Perl. You have a thing. You have Nancy. Is Nancy a number? Maybe. If you add zero to her. Um, <clears throat> so you have two numbers and you use ampersand, then it's acting on numbers. If you have two strings and you use ampersand, it's acting on strings. If you have a number and a string or a string and a number, what does it do? There's an answer, but it, at the point where you need to know the answer, you have lost the game. It's terrible. It is the one, one of the few places where Perl's idea of putting type information in the operators has failed. Here, the operator looks for type information. It will never find it, and so it guesses. 
So we've tried to fix this. And we don't fix it by adding types to the variables. That would be a very strange fix for Perl. Instead, we add it with more operators. That is the Perl way. So you can now say, I have two numbers that I want to bitwise and together, or two strings that I want to bitwise and together, byte by byte. You notice the difference here is that dot, okay? You can do that for and, or, XOR, and not. So there's now two forms of each of these that use the proper types when they operate. You need to say that you want to use experimental bitwise. It's an experimental feature. I can guarantee you, basically, this is gonna stick around. Uh, it's too good of a fix to really be thrown away. There is one thing that will be changed. What should the answer to that be? The answer you get is a smiley face on your screen. The answer you get is also a very confused face on your face. Because why would you ever do this? It doesn't make any sense. And the answer you will get in the next version of Perl is an exception, which is exactly what you deserve. Okay. Um, this is a new feature from last year, but it's a very exciting feature, so I like to talk about it. Um, there is a big problem with this code. You can look at it for a minute, and I'll tell you, the problem is this line is completely stupid. Who, it's like, it's as if we're writing Fortran. But Fortran had signatures. Why? Why do we have to look at the contents of our argument stack in the year 2015? Well, we don't as of the year 2015 because now you can write this and there is much rejoicing. This feature is actually uh, a lot more fun than you might think because uh, you can do this this is not fun, this is boring, everyone has seen this. You can have a default value, right? So now you can call it with one argument and the second defaults to zero. You can have two default values. Now there's still a problem with this code. Why do I have to waste all this time computing x plus zero if y wasn't given? That's, I have to do a whole addition operation? That's, that's no good. What if I just say, if y isn't given, return x immediately? Never enter the body of the subroutine. That's good. And if it's good for Y, it's good for X. Of course, this is the kind of code you would write in a silly one-off. Uh, in enterprise code, you would want much more uh, robust and configurable default behavior. So if you don't have Y, look up in your database your configuration for how the plus operator behaves with one operation, and there you go. That works, but if you use this code, uh, your life may be in danger. Coworkers may find it. I do not advise it, but I, had, I did test it and I couldn't stop giggling. Okay, <clears throat> uh, you don't only have to use scalar arguments, you can also use arrays. It works just like you want. Of course, you can only have one array at the end. Anything else would be ambiguous. You can also use hashes. You will get a warning, a runtime, excuse me, you get a runtime exception if, the, if you use an odd number of arguments to this function. It will say you could not possibly have passed pairs because it's an odd number. We did make one crucial change in Perl 522 to how subroutines work. Here we see a subroutine that not only takes, has a signature here, but also Attributes. This attribute is important because it's the prototype. It's what you used to get if you had uh, parentheses after your subroutine name. We're saying it's got a prototype. If you wrote this code in 520, it won't work in 522 because we moved the prototype over to the right. Really important. Okay. Uh, actually, I, this is a big, it's a big readability improvement, but the amount of argument that was spent on this change, ridiculous. Okay, uh, 
here we've got an example of a bunch of code written for Perl 5.8 that we want to improve. First thing we can do is pull up the arguments into a signature. And then we're gonna see all these arrows. I don't like arrows. So instead of putting the entries in the queue into a scalar, we'll make it an alias, and the arrows go away. I don't like these, this uh, prefix dereferencing, or this arrow here. So what if these in the signature became aliases to the arguments that were passed in as references? How about that? Well, it doesn't work yet. But maybe in Perl 524. So something to look forward to for next year. Other things you will see in Perl 524 include Unicode 8. This guy is the old Unicode guy. Boo. There is the new Unicode guys. Yay! Uh, Unicode 8 also has support for a number of new scripts. We have reached a point in Unicode history where every new version of Unicode is adding support for languages that are very obscure. All the major languages seem to be added. And so when you go through the change log for new Unicode and look up the Wikipedia pages, for every new script they add, I can spend days at my office desk like that, not working at all. It's great. Uh, more changes in, in the new Perl. These are all going to come out next year. Chadur. Chadur changes directory, changes to the directory you ask. And if you don't ask for any specific directory, it changes to the directory in the topic, in dollar underscore. If you change directory to undef or the empty string, it would change directory to your home directory. Uh, that's kind of a problem because you don't always have a home directory and it doesn't really know what to do. And much worse than that, what if you passed it a variable that accidentally was undef, that you didn't mean to be undef, and now instead of changing to your jail directory, you've gone to your home directory. So, now, if you try to change directory to undef or empty string, it will fail. It will tell you there's no such thing. It does the same thing that would happen in C. We've also added more double angles. Now, these are not the double diamond operator. These are even more interesting. You have these operators already, of course. These are the bit shift operators. And at first, they do what you want. Two right shifted one is one. Right shifting is, is uh, in some ways, repeated division by two. So what happens if we divide two? What if we shift two to the right twice? We get zero. Here's where our division breaks down. What we're doing is we're taking the bits and we're moving them over to the right in our bit string. If we take that two and we move its bits to the left, we get four. If we move it twice, we get eight. Now what happens if we take two and we shift it to the right 64 times. We get two. Same thing if we shift it to the left 64 times on my computer. On your computer, it might be different. Depending on your compiler, your architecture, it just falls back to whatever your, your C library does. How about if you left shift two by negative one? That's zero. Why is it zero? I have no idea. I, I, it doesn't make, or you left shift it again, right? So you've got, okay, I had two and I, I left shifted it negative one and I do it again and now you get this number, uh, which is a very big number. Why did you get that number? I don't know. So we have made this all make sense. It all makes sense now. All the, the stuff that made sense already still does, but now if you shift something a whole bunch to the right, all the bits fall off and you end up with zero. If you shift it a lot to the left, all the bits fall off the end and you get zero. Now, how far is a lot? That still depends on how big your integers are. But you can tell that by looking at your Perl's configuration. There's nothing about your C compiler or other magic that happens. And if you shift something a negative amount to the left, it is the same thing as shifting it a positive amount to the right because that's what makes sense. You shift something left, if you shift two left negative two times, 
It's the same as shifting it to the right two, positive two times. You get zero. Has anyone ever seen backslash capital C in a regular expression? No? It's just like matching dot, but it always matches one byte. Even if you've got a Unicode string, it always matches one byte. So it's a lot like saying use bytes with a scope of one code point in your regular expression. No, no, it's gone, gone, can't use it anymore. Auto dereference. Auto dereference was, was kind of interesting. If you had an array and you took a reference to it, then you could push directly onto the array reference without dereferencing it. Now that's good, right? It eliminates the double sigil, but it becomes confusing. You can't tell at compile time that this is any good. Uh, with some built-ins like keys or each, uh, it's even more confusing because is it gonna try to treat it like an array or like a hash? This has gotten thrown away. We can throw it away because we have something to replace it. Postfix dereferencing. We don't have to worry about a, <laughs> We don't have to worry about circumfix dereferencing this. On the left, we can postfix dereference it. And postfix dereferencing doesn't only work for the built-ins. Auto deref only worked on 15 places in Perl. Postfix dereferencing works everywhere. It's a much more general solution. So this has been thrown away. The lexical topic. You used to be able to say my dollar underscore. At first, it doesn't seem useful. And you think about it for a while and you think, oh, if I use my dollar underscore, then when I call subroutines, they won't be able to screw up the things I have in my topic. So you use it. And after you use it, you find out it was a very, very bad idea. It turns out that you'll accidentally make closures over dollar underscore, and then you have a grep, and the grep is looking at my dollar underscore instead of topical dollar, it's, very, very weird. So we have fixed this feature by deleting it. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting idea. We all had a lot of fun and now it's gone. Postfix dereferencing, on the other hand, has been accepted. This is exciting. In 518, Perl 518, we introduced the idea of experimental features. We always had experimental features in Perl, but there was no rules about them and people would use them. For example, until Perl 518, weak references were an experimental feature. No one thinks that weak references are an experiment. If we changed the way weak references behaved, they would have my head on a platter. Uh, we made new rules about what is and isn't an experiment. And when something is an experiment and you use it, Perl will yell at you. It'll say, this is an experiment, Shouldn't use this unless you're just playing around. This is the first thing that began as an experiment and has stopped being an experiment that we believe is working and good. And uh, hopefully we'll see even more things go through this process and succeed, become real features. Other things that may change next year, warnings. Right now, if you say use warnings, it turns on all your warnings. And if you say use fatal warnings, where instead of printing to Stadere, to standard error, they will, uh, they will die. If you say use warnings fatal, it means use warnings fatal all, all warnings become fatal. Well, the problem is this. Someone says I have this code and I really think that there should be a warning here because I've accidentally put a smiley face into my regular expression. Probably a mistake, probably shouldn't be there, I want a warning. And some people say that's a really, really good idea, I like that, we need that smiley warning. So there's a big thread on the mailing list arguing about the smiley face warning. And this big mailing list thread makes everyone feel very unhappy. We don't wanna argue about whether we can have new warnings. And if you turn on every warning every time, you can't really add new warnings easily. But if we change so use warnings means use the default warnings, and use warnings fatal means use the default fatal warnings, then we can add this warning. And you only get it if instead of saying use warnings, which is now default and not all, you say I want the default warnings 
and the smiley face warnings. And if you want everything, you can still say everything, but don't. We want to apply the same thing to strictures too. What if we want a new kind of stricture? Here, we're pulling events out and printing them to a log file. Seems totally reasonable until after six days of operation, you look at your log file and you find this. Oh, right. What if you could have strict stringification? You can't accidentally stringify a reference that doesn't support it. Well, we can't just add that to Perl if all strictures turn on when you say use strict. But if we have the ability to have new strictures added, we can add this. So, that's been Perl 522 and Perl 524. Perl 522 is available now. You can download it and install it. Uh, I'm actually running Perl 523 which is the experimental monthly release of Perl. We had a new one come out just yesterday. Uh, yes, it's great. Uh, in fact, uh, speaking of Perl 523, I was going to do the release myself and uh, I had no problem, I was ready to do it. And then I thought, wait, I'm going to be at Yapsi Asia in Japan. I don't think I should do this release and I had to beg someone, please, please take over this release for me. That was Matthew Horsfall who deserves all of our thanks and praise forever. Uh, so Perl 522 is available now. It's got a higher version number than ever before. It's another feature I did not mention. Uh, I think that concludes everything I want to say about Perl 522 and 24, uh, and I'm ready to take questions. So the question is, why did we introduce the double diamond instead of fixing the diamond? Uh, it's a good question, and it's a question that we talked about on the mailing list. And it came down to, in Perl 5, we try very hard to preserve backwards compatibility because we know that not only do we have a lot of people who write modules that get installed as applications with extensive test suites, we also have systems, system administrators who have written Perl programs that have to just work out of cron jobs and daemon tools that were written years and years ago and have no test suites, they just work. And they also have to just run against system Perl. So if you update uh, your, your Debian or you install your stack of system administration programs on your newly built Solaris box, it has to work. And there are people who had real programs in production that would pass program specifications as arguments to their program to be used as part of the diamond operator. And it's a big question. Do we want to break those programs or which would make existing programs that didn't want that behavior more secure? Or did we want to leave that as a, a, a problem but have programs that use it on purpose keep working? And that is exactly the place where the most interesting discussions on the Perl 5 Porter's mailing list occur uh, about where that balance is. And the decision ended up being uh, we would add a new operator so that the old operator would keep working for people who needed it. And as, a, as an addendum to that, we will probably add switches to Perl to use that behavior when you use the dash N and dash P switches. Uh, to use safe open, which also now uses two argument open. Anyone else? We'll have to get the next question on the other side of the room again so we can keep the microphone doing good laps.
Thanks for the awesome talk. So uh, I would like I just uh, just uh, uh, point, uh, ask about the metal signature. In the <laughs> what would be a good way to like uh, uh, solve that kind of problem where with metal signatures where you actually have uh, you need to have a big uh, uh, like writing aid or something inside the metal signature. So uh, let me let me restate the question. You tell me if I if I understood. I believe the question is. How do you want to solve the problem of having a very complicated default yeah. without putting, yeah. So um, there's two parts to answer that. So you have a subroutine signature and it needs a default and the default is quite complicated. And if you put it into the signature as I did earlier, it looks ridiculous. <clears throat> you can just put it there. It's really, it, it's okay. But I would in general put that default into uh, the body of the program and start by saying the default is undef or using some other sentinel value. If the value that came into the subroutine through its signature is the sentinel value, like an undef or negative one or whatever you like, then you invoke the default code. Um, one thing you can't tell in Perl signatures is whether the value that you have is from the default or was given. So if you have add, add x, y, and both x and y default to zero, and you look at y and it's zero, you don't know whether someone called add one zero or called add one. There's a lot of argument about this. How can you tell? You should be able to tell. And uh, I, I stopped the argument by saying, maybe some people will want to know, but if you look at basically every other language in this space, no one tells you whether it came from a default or not. And if everyone else is doing okay, we'll probably do okay too. But we may add uh, the ability to see something like argc, how many arguments there were, which would be another way without a sentinel value to know where the defaults were. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you very much. For, for any operator? For, yeah, uh, so the question is, what, why do we add new operators? Is it, is it to, for better language design, to make the language more convenient? <clears throat> Adding new operators is, so when you, look at, when you look at Perl, you wanna be able to see what the code is saying very quickly. And operators usually are something that stand out. They look very different from words. They're funny little symbols. And by adding a new operator, you can add a very quick way to see what the code is trying to say. But also, the amount of space we have for operators is small. I mean, we could have as many operators as we want, but the more you add, the less distinct they can be from each other. The harder it is to tell, to look at the code and see it's that operator. So, Adding operators is something we do, I would say, almost as a last resort. We want to add operators when it will make the program more convenient to write, easier to read, when it's something that you will use fairly often, um, or when it is necessary to match the existing design. So uh, adding the bitwise string operator is not something you will use very often, but if bitwise string and bitwise number operators looked very different, the language design would be no good. But adding something like uh, a, a smart match operator uh, looks very distinct, has a very broad uh, realm of applicability. It's very useful in many cases, so using an operator is there. But for most things, uh, we start by saying, can it be a CPAN module? If it can't be a CPAN module, can it be a built-in? like chadur or, or push. If it can't be a built-in, maybe we'll consider it being an operator, but it, it has to be very useful to, to consider it at that point. Does, does that answer your question? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.